Sinks, showers, toilets, and baths, they all send wastewater into the sewer system. But have you ever really considered the path that wastewater takes once it's out of sight and out of mind? You might know that it usually flows to a nearby treatment plant that can clean it up. But on the way, it might pass through a wastewater lift station, like this one outside San Antonio, Texas. We've been watching it be built from the ground up, or really the ground down. In the last episode, almost all the backfill and concrete at the site were completed. Plus, the wet well and manholes were lined with a protective epoxy coating. But there's a lot more to do before this facility is up and running, pumping the area's wastewater uphill to the treatment plant. I'll walk you through the whole process and show you how this pump station works in this final episode of the series. I'm your host, Grady Hillhouse, and this is Practical Construction. Pipes are arriving on site to the San Antonio River Authority's newest wastewater lift station. Now that most of the underground work is done, it's time to start installing the equipment that will connect the wet well to the uphill treatment plant. The pipes arrive with a protective coating that, in most cases, needs to be removed. The sandblasting rig is here, and so is the sand that will be used to clean these pipes and get them ready for paint. The process of sandblasting, also called abrasive media blasting, uses compressed air to fire media through a hose. In this case, the media is sand, but there are lots of other materials that can be sent through a hose with compressed air. All the steel pipes for the project are blasted clean of the protective factory coating. This gives the flanges fresh surfaces so they will seal together correctly, and it cleans and roughens the outside of the pipes to prepare them for final coating. Once blasted clean, the pipes are ready to be painted, but you rarely hear it call that in the field. Paint used to protect metal surfaces is mostly just called coating by the pros. This spray painting rig also uses a pressurized air supply from a trailer mounted compressor to deliver paint to the nozzle. All the pipes and fittings are masked off to make sure none of the coating gets on the flanges or inside. Then they're set up on sawhorses and coated. All the fittings and reducers get coated as well. But we don't just hope the coating meets the project specifications, we double check. This is a dry film thickness gauge that uses a magnet to measure how much paint is built up around the pipe. Turn the wheel until the indicator pops up and it tells you the coating thickness in mils, which are thousandths of an inch or about 25 microns. Once confirmed that the coating meets specifications, it's almost time to start installing the pipes. The very first lines will go into the wet well, but the scaffolding inside has to be removed before that. This assembly has been useful to hold up the formwork while the concrete top was cast and for the spray liners to stand on while they did their work, but now it's in the way. It gets dismantled inside the wet well, and each piece is lifted out one by one. While one crew gets the last pieces of scaffolding out, another starts laying out the locations for all the pipes using string lines. The strings make it easier to get nice straight lines as pipes, fittings, and valves are moved into position. And plumb lines mark the locations at the bottom of the wet well directly below each of the three blockouts in the concrete lid at the top. A lot of these pipes are quite heavy, so the mobile crane is brought back to the site one more time to help lift them into place. It gets into position, and then the operator puts down the outriggers to help create a stable base. And finally, it's time to start installing pipes. The first discharge line is lowered into the wet well through the hatch. It's attached to a special quick-release connection system already installed at the bottom of the wet well. We'll see this in action later in the episode. The next section of the first discharge line is lowered into the wet well through the hatch. It's set at the bottom of the wet well, 
then re-rigged through the concrete block out at the top and lifted into place. Once positioned correctly, the flanges are bolted together. This gets repeated for the other two discharge lines. The first pipe is lowered into the wet well and attached to the pump discharge quick release. Then the second line is put in, disconnected, reattached through the block out and lifted into place. The space between each of the discharge lines and the concrete block out are filled with link seals just like the sewer lines coming into the wet well. Before long, it's time to start connecting the above ground sections of pipe. These pipes will sit on supports that are bolted into the concrete pad. Holes are drilled, and then anchors get epoxied into the holes. Once cured, the anchors will hold each pipe support rigidly to the slab. Most of the above ground piping and fittings come together using flanges. A gasket between the flanges creates a pressure rated seal, and the ring of nuts and bolts hold each pipe section tightly to its neighbor. All these pipes and fittings come together pretty quickly, but it'll be easiest to understand them if we go in order. I'll walk you through the whole assembly in a minute, but I want to start with the pumps, and they haven't been installed in the wet well just yet. Before they go in, the bottom needs a little work. Since the pumps will be installed near the center of the wet well, the outside corners could be an area where solids accumulate. The engineer specified that the bottom of the wet well be sloped toward the pumps in a bowl shape to make sure there are no stagnant areas where solids might settle out of suspension. And that's going to take some more concrete. A concrete pump arrives to the site and gets set up by extending its boom. The truck lowers a hose into the wet well, and a finishing crew works to get the new bottom perfectly sloped toward where the pumps will eventually sit. Once this concrete cures, the coating crew returns to finish up the epoxy liner at the bottom of the wet well. And finally, it's time to put in the pumps. Each of these pumps is rated to use 50 kilowatts or 67 horsepower of electricity to move around 800 gallons or 3,000 liters per minute to an elevation of around 200 feet or 60 meters above this lift station. And there will be three of them in the wet well. These pumps are specifically designed for sewage applications. The San Antonio River Authority hopes that no one would put anything except water, human waste, and toilet paper into the sewage system, and especially not wipes. But in the case that something larger or more fibrous finds its way to this lift station, the impellers and the pumps have a special shape to avoid getting caught on stringy debris. And if a pump does get clogged, each one can be disconnected from the discharge line and lifted with a chain out of the wet well for service. That means installing these pumps for the first time is a pretty simple job. Each pump has a knuckle that fits into vertical guides that run along the discharge pipes. A hoist or crane simply lowers the pump along the guides. When the pump reaches the bottom, it seals against the discharge line with its own weight, providing a pressure-rated connection without having to send someone to the bottom of the wet well to tighten bolts. Each of the pump's chains is hooked at the top of the hatch to make it easy to remove a pump from the wet well for inspection or service. And the electrical cables are securely attached there as well. Those electrical connections run in conduits through the concrete and up to the junction boxes where they're attached to the rest of the control system. Part of the job of the control system is to know when to turn the pumps on. So this wet well needs a liquid level sensor the sensor is installed inside a stilling well, a length of pipe inside the wet well meant to isolate the sensor from any splashing or waves that happen from the wastewater flow. This is really just a length of PVC pipe that extends almost the entire height of the wet well. You can see the stilling well at the top right in this shot as crews start to fill the wet well with water for its first test. And you can see the float switches installed as well. If the level sensor stops working or something else goes wrong, these simple float switches will set off an alarm 
and flash a light at the top of the control shelter to let operators know that the level is too low, which could cause the pumps to run dry and overheat, or too high, which could cause a backup in one or more of the sewer lines or an overflow. The wet well also gets a gooseneck vent to equalize the air pressure inside and out. This water's just for testing the pumps, but before long, wastewater will start flowing into this wet well from the surrounding sewer lines. When the liquid reaches a prescribed level, it will trigger the control system to automatically turn on one of the pumps, called the lead pump. And if the level keeps going up, a second pump, called the lag pump, will turn on too. This lead lag configuration helps the station account for variable flow rates, and the third pump acts as a standby. The lead pump, lag pump, and standby alternate so that they wear down evenly over time. Each pump has its own discharge line we saw be installed that comes up through the concrete to an above ground manifold. First, the lines are each equipped with a pressure gauge that makes it easy to see if a pump is running, and if so, at the right pressure. Then each line gets a check valve that only allows flow in one direction. This valve prevents one pump from simply backflowing wastewater into the wet well through another pump's discharge line. Next, the lines each have plug valves so they can be isolated for maintenance. Pipes and valves don't last forever, so everything in this facility has been designed to make it easy to serve as parts and keep things up and running. After the isolation valves, all the individual lines come together into a single pipe that passes through an automatic air release valve. Air bubbles that get into the line can get stuck at this high point and constrict the flow. This valve uses weights and a float to automatically release air from the line without letting any of the wastewater out. As you might imagine, air bleeding from a pipe full of raw sewage isn't exactly pleasant to smell, so the air bleed line runs right back to the wet well. This also keeps wastewater from leaking onto the ground if this valve were to malfunction. And just like this facility is designed for ease of maintenance, it's also designed with lots of redundancy. The three pumps are just the start. Sewage keeps flowing, even during emergencies and power outages, so this pump station is designed with contingencies. A fourth pump, this one powered by diesel, can keep the wastewater flowing if this facility loses grid power. We saw its foundation installed in the previous episode, and now it's time to put the pump in place. The diesel pump has a suction line installed in the wet well you can see here, and its discharge line runs to the above ground manifold with a check valve and plug valve like the others. But even if all four pumps are out of service, the manifold also includes an emergency bypass so that the San Antonio River Authority could bring in another mobile pump, hook it up quickly and avoid a backup or overflow. All five pump discharge lines come together ahead of the flow meter that keeps an accurate record of how much fluid passes through the pipes each day. Operators can compare the readings on this meter to the ones at the end of the line to make sure there are no leaks or equipment malfunctions between the two. One last plug valve makes it possible to isolate the entire facility for maintenance, and then wastewater leaves the pump station into the force main. This is a pressure-rated sewer line that was installed during construction of the original lift station, and now it's time to connect it to the new facility. Crews extended this line toward the new pump station earlier in the project, but waited for the final pieces until the discharge manifold was finalized. They install elbows to turn the corner. Each connection is attached with a compression fitting called a mechanical joint. The final length of underground pipe is installed. Then concrete is placed at each of the bins to create structures called thrust blocks that will distribute the pressure into the soil and keep the pipe from moving over time. The metal pipe is wrapped in plastic. All the underground piping is backfilled. And now this lift station has a direct connection to the wastewater treatment plant nearby. In many ways, a wet well type lift station is just like a sump pump in your basement. The water level comes up, triggers a float switch, the pump comes on, 
and the water level drops back down. But in many ways, this facility is not anything like a basement sump pump, and most of those ways are electrical. Let's take a look at the power and control systems of the pump station. Both the original list station on this site and the new one are fed power from the grid through these new 480 volt transformers installed by the electric utility. Each of the three phases runs through a disconnect switch, allowing the entire facility to be isolated from the grid, a meter so the utility can bill for power usage, and then a fused switch that will protect the equipment in the event of a short circuit. Each of these monster fuses is rated for 350 amps at 500 volts. That's a lot of power. From there, power hits to the control shelter and its panels. Another disconnect switch allows the new pump station to be isolated for maintenance. And then a transfer switch is installed. Again, it's all about redundancy. If the power goes out, the San Antonio River Authority can bring in a mobile generator and connect it directly to the equipment here flip the transfer switch, and power the lift station off-grid. And a transformer converts the 480 volt service to 120 volts for the lights, outlets, and other controls. Of course, a high voltage facility like this needs a robust connection to the ground to protect workers and make sure that a fault can be identified quickly. Copper rods are hammered deep into the ground and welded to the conductors to create a good bond. The entire grounding system gets tested to make sure it's well connected to the earth. A small current is run between the ground rods and a test electrode on the other side of the construction site, and the resistance between the two is recorded. If the resistance were too high, more ground rods would have to be installed, but the system passed the test just fine. This panel houses the remote terminal unit for the San Antonio River Authority's Supervisory Control and Data Acquisition, or SCADA, system. Rather than send someone to this lift station to record data or change the controls, it's easier to pipe everything to a centralized location. SCADA is a type of industrial network that interconnects sensors, controls, and databases to keep accurate records and enable remote control of facilities like this one. An antenna at the top of the shelter gives the lift station a wireless connection, and the remote terminal unit provides an interface for an operator at the lift station. But that doesn't mean there aren't manual controls. This is the pump control panel that allows an operator to start and stop each of the three pumps. It includes circuitry to soft start each one to avoid huge power surges, cycle through the pumps so they wear evenly, and error systems to shut down a pump if it overheats or loses a seal. The panel next to it has the circuit breakers for each pump to protect them against short circuits. These panels connect to the pumps through underground conduits we saw be installed in an earlier episode. The electricians had a pretty clever way to run the cables through. First, they tie a plastic bag on a string and suck it to the other side with a vacuum. Then the cables can be tied to the string and pulled through each conduit. Once all the electrical work is done, this project is getting close to wrapping up. The contractor starts cleaning up the site to prepare for the last items. One of those items is installing bollards to protect the lift station from an errant vehicle. They attached drilled concrete piles to create a strong and sturdy foundation. Then the last concrete of the job goes in. This lab connects the new lift station to the old one, creating a drivable area for maintenance personnel and operators. They also replace the concrete that was removed to trench in one of the sewer lines below the original pump station. The bollards are installed, and the concrete is complete. Now all that's left is to get this facility in operation. The first test of the pumps won't be sewage, but water from the city distribution system. If something goes wrong, it's a lot easier to fix it before the sewage hits the proverbial fan. The hose goes into the wet well, and it slowly starts to fill up for the test. On testing day, the plan is simple turn on each of the pumps to confirm it's operating as designed. 
the pump manufacturer has a representative on site to help with the process. Each pump is turned on. They check the pressure on the gauge to make sure it's right. And they check the flow meter to ensure the pump is moving the right amount of fluid out of the wet well. You can easily see the level in the wet well dropping as each pump is turned on. Finally, they run the emergency diesel pump to confirm it's working as well. It sounds easier than it really is to check everything in this sophisticated facility and confirm it's working properly for the very first time, but before long, all the equipment passes the checks with flying colors. It's been almost an entire year of work to get the San Antonio River Authority's newest lift station built and running. We followed the process from the first scoop of dirt until now. And if you look closely, you can see how much the surrounding area grew just during that time. Those new developments and new houses will depend on this pumping station to carry wastewater away to the uphill treatment plant. All the people who live and work in this area might not ever even know it's there. And that's kind of the point. We want our sewage to be out of mind and out of sight. But I hope you've enjoyed getting an up-close look at what it really takes to keep our modern world running and all the hard work that goes into even the most hidden parts of our constructed environment. Huge thanks to the San Antonio River Authority for inviting us onto their project, their engineer UEG for fielding all our questions about the design, and their contractor, MGC and all their subs for putting up with us on the job site to document the process. It really is not a small thing to have a film crew watching you work, especially when your job is hard enough as it is. Thanks to our streaming partner, Nebula, where you can watch the whole series ad-free at the link below, and huge thanks to the practical engineering team who made this series possible. There's a relatively new term in Italian, umarel. I'm sure I'm pronouncing that wrong, but it refers to retired people who spend their days watching construction sites. I really believe we all deserve to be those old pensioners, seeing how the world gets built around us firsthand and documenting the construction of heavy civil infrastructure has been a dream of mine for a long time. It took a ton of work from everyone involved to make it happen, but hopefully we made it look effortless. What do you think? Is this something you'd like to see more of? Does it belong on the Practical Engineering channel or as its own thing? What kind of projects would you like to see in serial form like this? And do you know anyone in the heavy civil construction world in Central Texas who wouldn't mind having a film crew on their site? I really do want to hear your feedback, so shoot me an email or leave a comment below. Thank you for watching, and let me know what you think. 